morning, everybody. Welcome to the Meta Cafe. Grab your cup of coffee or your tea, sit back and relax, and let's chat about what is happening up in the sky today. I hope you're all doing well this morning. It's kind of a windy, blustery, rainy, cloudy day here in the Pacific Northwest. And you can tell because like everything looks muted in my room. As I look in the light, I'm like, wow, I either need more light uh, I don't know. It's just kind of a weird day here today. So uh, today, I hope uh, everybody remembers that I, I it is a void of course moon, and it's all day, right? All day since 4:47 in the morning for you all on the east coast, and 1:47 for me here on the west coast. The moon went into the void and stays there until 7 something this evening, 7:30 p.m. this evening, my time. So 10:30 p.m. for you all on the east coast. That means all day through the whole work day, the moon is in a quiet place. It is not in a place where it's going to deliver you some kind of massive action oriented energy for you to get out and do anything. It's really more in that quieter space. And so I don't know if you guys get to see the titles of uh, the shows uh, in the morning. I have no idea why it has me fill all this out because I don't see where it shows up, but um, it was that today's a day for inner work and for contemplation. It's a quieter day. So when the moon does go into the void, sometimes it's only doing that for an hour, for a couple minutes. I've seen short, like 10 minute void, of course, moons, but this one happens to be a, an elongated one, more than 12 hours. Actually, that would be what, 12 and uh, seven. So about 19 hour void, of course, moon, long time, a long moon. So, but that's good because it gives us that power time to really move inward and work on some things. Maybe um, instead of focusing on uh, doing things, you can just focus on being or maybe looking at some goals or maybe looking at, you know, uh, some of thing self-study. Uh, I know yesterday I began a process of doing my, my Gene Keys uh, sequences again. I was really curious about that now that I have a, a, a higher understanding of the gene keys and it's been, gosh, it's probably been a year since I last did any of the sequences. Mm -hmm. So I went to um, start up uh, the sequence again. The There's three, three sequences. There's the activation sequence, the Venus sequence, and then the Pearl sequence. And all three of them are taking you through different levels of what you know to be your human design. But if you've also gotten your gene keys profile, it would be your gene keys profile. And it takes you fairly deep into who you are. And every time I've done it, this would be the third time, um, I come back with new information about who I am or something I've missed in the processes before. So it's really a worthwhile opportunity to reread about yourself through the Gene Keys or the Hologenetic Profile. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, then go to genekeys.com or do a search for hologenetic profile and you will come to the page where you can insert all of your information and get your profile. It's free. You got to like that. And then you have that. So when we're talking about it, you'll have your own version of it in front of you. I think that's a great idea. Uh, let's see, who do we have out here this morning? We have Rebecca, good morning, and Debbie Haddon and Marissa. Natasha, good morning, and Chanel, good morning. Colleen, good morning. Debbie Hedden says, good morning. Finally able to make it live again. Awesome. And uh, maybe, you, did you have your grandkids in the morning or something, Debbie? Uh, Rebecca says, I really like your titles. So you guys do get to see them. I love it. I didn't know you saw it. I thought it was just having me put stuff in for, you know, no real good reason. <laughs> good morning, Michelle. Great to see you with us this morning. And Marisa says, when you go through the sequence, you use the book and match up with the hologenetic profile. Yes. Um, now you don't have to, if you pay, if you pay to go through the sequences, which I did initially when way back when, um, he actually has the recordings of the gene keys for you personally that are there in, uh, the coursework. Um, I don't know if that's the same now for new people going in. I would imagine it is though, because, uh, I mean, it's the same system. And, um, I, I think the part that I get to is that I like to have the book in my hand. 
right? I like to have that, idea, uh, you know, the, the tangible book that I can underline or highlight or write notes in um, as well. I like, I, I, you know, I tell you guys to do this all the time, but I set up a notebook and this notebook has all of my gene keys material in it. So it has my hologenetic profile in it, right? My little bubbles. It has all, uh, I put extra paper in it. And um, of course, for me, because I went on to become a Gene Keys ambassador, it also has all my ambassadors work in it. But I keep it close because uh, the, just for example, the other day I was thinking to myself, what was my, what was it, uh, my EQ? right? What was my EQ? We were talking about SQ, EQ, and IQ. And EQ being the, the emotional uh, development piece. And I went, oh yeah, EQ, where is that? That was gate 29. Well, the 29 is the gate of saying yes. So in my emotional development, somewhere along the line, this idea of saying yes to things, being uh, the idea of commitment um, came into being in my emotional field. And so when I look at that, I go, hmm, I wonder what that means. The, the low expression is half-heartedness. The second one is commitment or the gift level is commitment. And then the highest expression is devotion. And I know that in my own life, I struggle with commitment, not to people or to uh, things, but to myself. Um, it, it's really an interesting thing. And it happens to be the North Node, the design North Node in your uh, human design. So it's interesting to do that. And then you have the book in hand and you can read through everything from the shadow to the gift to the city and take notes and see where are you in all of that. Not as a way to beat yourself up, but just as a contemplation as to where am I progressing or where am I not progressing? Where am I still struggling with the same things over and over again? And, uh, you know, being able to work through all of that. So it's a worthwhile Thing to have both the book and the hologenetic profile and to be able to match that up. Uh, so good morning, Marjorie and Mimi. And Rebecca says, oh, yes, that's how I found you on YouTube. Ah, April, good morning to you. That's good to know, Rebecca. I always think of YouTube as this bottomless pit of nobody finds me, nobody sees me. I mean, my, I put those videos, these videos that I do every morning, I put them up and uh, I don't know I don't know how YouTube works. I have much better luck with Facebook and LinkedIn than I do with YouTube. But I continue to put those videos up there because I know some people find them there. Some people like the video and I also upload these shows. I take these shows when we're done and I turn them into MP3s and I then load them up to Blog Talk Radio so it becomes a podcast and then it is available through all of the podcast channels. Whatever podcast thing you can think of, uh, my podcast is there, uh, or this morning broadcast is there as a podcast. So people can get it delivered to them however they like to get their content. Some people like to read it. I don't do the reading part. That's interesting. I should do that. I do the, the voice, I do the video, and then I do the live. So uh, interesting. So all right. So today, again, then we start the day in void, of course. We are in it all day. The last aspect, by the way, that the moon made before it went into the void isn't what I thought it was going to be. Yesterday, I was like, hallelujah, it'll be an opposition to Mercury. No, it is a, a trine to Pluto. So on one hand, I think sometimes don't you get burned out with the Pluto stuff, right? Doing that deep dive and having to look deeper and ask questions and look deeper and ask more questions and look deeper. Sometimes I get really tired of all of that, but a trine to Pluto, a trine to Pluto that we're left with for the entire void, of course, gives us easy access to triggers, to uh, what's hidden in the subconscious mind, to being able to deal with those emotions in a very powerful way, to empower yourself, and to be able to make some, see some movement even in how it is that you show up in the world. So, and I'm going to give you an example of this yesterday. I guess this did start yesterday afternoon for me. And it's not unusual for me to experience it days ahead of time because then I have to come back and talk about it to you guys. Gives me the, the samples or examples that, that are going to help you guys. Um, I was doing a trade with a friend yesterday 
uh, doing her solar return reading and she was helping me get some business goals set up for 2020, which I hate doing. I am loath to do that, right? Because it always means that I have to look at moving forward with my business and it's a tricky subject for me, right? I'm really good at getting on here and talking to you guys about stuff, but I'm really not good at promoting myself. That is like the worst thing. And I always know as soon as I'm going to do this with her, she's going to say, you know, what are you doing about that? So yesterday, sure enough, <laughs> um, I found myself in the pity party uh, with all of that business goals and business, uh, you know, promotion, marketing and all of that. Yuck, right? That's just my yuck. And uh, she called me on every bit of it. It was so funny. But what it did do was cause me to look at where am I playing the victim in all of this? Because that's, she said it to me. She said, you're playing victim. And I went, oh my God, you're right. But I didn't tell her that right away. I was like, oh my God, she's absolutely right. I'm playing victim here. Uh, so I was also then caught up in diving deep into what is it that is holding me back? Why is it that I give up on myself or, you know, I'm just like you guys, right? I may deal with a little bit of different thing problems than you, but you know, everybody has different problems. Mine are just this business thing that just keeps sticking in my craw and calling me, you know, kind of like the choker chain that pulls you back. And so I'm also having to move through these things. And right now with the trine to Pluto is a good time to do that dive, but beautifully in a, a self-supportive way, not in a way that I'm, I'm not beating myself up over it. Actually, I woke up this morning and it was funny because she sent me a, a, a video a message just a little bit ago after I'd already thought, wow, I'm really glad she, she played tough love with me yesterday. She was texting me or uh, doing a video chat with me saying, I'm so sorry if I hurt your feelings. And I'm like, no, it was perfect. You didn't hurt my feelings. Actually, I was cracking up because of the way it was going. But uh, it, it's an opportunity for us when the moon leaves us with a very powerful transit that we can work on ourselves or we can work on those problems. We can work on whatever it is that, you know, seems to be our Achilles heel and move through some powerful things. So the last aspect that trying to Pluto indicates an ease and a flow of the energy between the moon and the emotions and Pluto and empowerment or transformation. Um, remember, Pluto is really about regeneration. It destroys, crashes down in order to build back up. And that's exactly what I'm feeling like I'm in the process of. So, I, you know, I bet some of you are feeling that same sort of crash and burn and uh, Phoenix rising again. And that's exactly what today might be really good for doing that inner work to discover where that is and then to work through it for yourself. And if you're not doing it today, that's okay, because the fact is, it's going to come up. It's going to come up for everybody over the course of time. Now, because I, I, by the way, announcement, I won't be here tomorrow morning. I have to go get my eyes checked. Um, they wouldn't refill my drops unless I went in to see the doctor. So I have to go to get my eyes examined tomorrow. So I'm doing that first thing in the morning. So I won't be here in the morning. So we are going to talk now about the moon in Gemini, because that is where the moon will be as we move into this evening. And when you get up tomorrow, all day, the moon will be in the sign of Gemini. So remember yesterday, we were talking about how is the, the, the moon is sort of doing this move through these signs, and it's sort of an undulation between energy that is more driving and, you know, action oriented, then more laid back energy, and then another drive, and then laid back and drive. You could look at this as the alternation of masculine energy, feminine energy, with Aries, the start of it all being masculine, Taurus being feminine, Gemini now, we're back to masculine, and masculine energy is more outward energy, um, it is more extroverted energy, it is more action-oriented energy. So tomorrow as, or tonight, as the moon moves into Gemini, we begin to become more sociable. The moon in Gemini is very much a, uh, a community-oriented sign uh, or placement where 
uh, wants to be in the social limelight or wants to be chatting with people. There's quick wit. There's this love of variety and sort of like the bumblebee moving from flower to flower uh, in terms of their social awareness or social ability. And it, you don't have to be a Gemini to be that way. When the moon is moving through Gemini, wherever Gemini is in your chart is where the, uh, the tempo seems to pick up, where there's more variety available to you. Um, there's also mental flexibility going on when the moon moves through Gemini. There's logic and cleverness and seeing things perhaps in a different way. Your mind is more flexible, so it, it, it jumps faster from one idea to another or jumps from that one idea and turns that one upside down and sees things in a different way. So we have that mental flexibility when the moon turns into the sign of Gemini. There's also more activity. It's a very active sign, let's say, where there's motion, there's movement, there's driving around, there's on the energy of being on the move, right? Flitting even from one thing to another, one activity to another. It's a great day to get a lot of errands done or to get a lot of tasks done, to be task oriented, to, you know, clear off your desk, if you will, not because you want it clean like you would if it was energy in Virgo, but because there's this energy of being busy. And what better way to clean off your desk than to use that energy, right? <laughs> I'll have to remind myself of that tomorrow. Um, the sign of Gemini rules the internet and gossip and exchanging of ideas and curiosity. So you're following those threads. I like to call it following the threads. If you hear about something, follow the thread. I do this naturally anyway. Someone will bring up a topic to me, and before you know it, I'm, I'm digging deep. I'm looking for all of the information that I can find on a topic of interest. And then I may share that information or not. Sometimes it's just for my own edification, right? I just want to know. And in, with the moon in Gemini, we just want to know, right? We just want to know. So we go and we find that information. And there is also, Gemini is also very people oriented. It, right, we said that with the sociability, but it's also engaged with, uh, first of all, the sign Gemini rules siblings. So we are apt to have more conversations perhaps over the next few days with our siblings, with our neighbors, or the people in our community, like our extended family even. So, you know, cousins, aunts, and uncles, and I don't know, in my case, I have now, you know, all of these extra siblings that likely I will probably reach out to. It seems to go into this flow, right, where you reach out to people and it's because the moon may be in a more sociable setting and it makes you more apt to be sociable or wanting to converse with people. And there are some things to watch out for, just like with every sign, there's the more the, the negative uh, energy that's also potential. And so we have to watch out for monkey mind when the moon is in Gemini. Your mind is flitting from one thing to another and possibly scattering your focus. So if you have something that you really need to focus on, you might want to do that today. And then later this evening when, you know, the work day is done, uh, get the remote control out and just surf, channel surf. Tomorrow and the next day after that will be less, will be a little more difficult to focus on anything for any particular length of time. We also sometimes feel a little more superficial when the moon is in Gemini, like we just want the facts, just the top. We don't necessarily want to dig deep. Um, and we can also use words. I wrote the word mischievous, use of words. By mischievous, I mean sometimes Gemini energy is very witty. And witty sometimes can have that bite to it, right? That cut. So you want to be careful that you don't use words in a cutting way over the next few days in your attempt to be humorous or witty uh, because it could be hurtful to someone. So we just have to take more care about how we say what we say during those next couple of days. So let's see, we have more people checking in with us this morning. Uh, we have Latricia, good morning to you. Debbie Tibbetts, two meal, good morning. Catherine, good morning. Mimi says, good to know, as I really will benefit from running errands tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It'll be a good day to get things done, right? It'll be a good day. And we, we seem to do that anyway, naturally, depending 
it doesn't even really matter, I guess, what sign it's in. After a long void of course moon, it's like waking up in the morning after a long night's sleep, right? Where you start the hustle and bustle of your day. Um, so tomorrow would be like starting up the hustle and bustle of the day, only with the energy in Gemini, it has more uh, capricious energy attached to it. So we can move around and flit around. I was, it was funny because I'm thinking this morning, oh yeah, I'm going to go get my eyes checked. I'm going to be in town. What else can I do while I'm in town? Then I remembered, oh duh, they dilate your eyes. You're not going to see very well. And luckily I think it's going to be cloudy and rainy tomorrow. So that'll help my eyes because when I always manage to get my eyes dilated on a day when it's bright and sunny and uh, yeah, yeah, that hurts your eyes. Uh, so anyway, I was already thinking like, okay, what can I get done tomorrow while I'm in town? So uh, definitely, definitely a greater day tomorrow to get errands done. Good morning, Paulette. And Latricia says, hello, all. Uh, good, 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 good. So we have a lot of people joining us this morning. If you guys have questions, feel free to type them there in the chat. Um, Colleen says, I found you via Apple Podcasts. Yep, that's one of the places that Blog Talk loads up my work to. And uh, lately, I've found podcasts places that, I mean, I've never even heard of. So apparently podcasts are a big deal. And so it is lucky for me that I know how to turn these in, these MP4s into MP3s and load them up. So it's kind of interesting to, uh, with technology, what you can do, how you can repurpose, you know, one broadcast into all of these different things. All righty. So uh, there are not any huge, um, you know, transits going on today nor tomorrow. So you won't be missing anything tomorrow by me not being there. Um, there is a minor thing going on today between Mercury and Chiron that I want you to know about. It is a sesquiquadrate also known as a minor square. It is the 90 degree square plus a half of a square. So 90 plus 45 degrees, 135 degree angle between the two planets. So between Mercury and Scorpio and Chiron in Aries. And it creates a minor sort of irritation that, you know, splinter feeling in your finger that, you know, you've got to get in there and dig at it. And if you don't dig into it and get it out, it's just going to go deeper and deeper and become more of an irritant. So what is the irritant that we're working with? Well, Mercury rules communication and the mind. And Chiron, of course, is the wounded healer. So it's possible that words trigger wounds, right? Words trigger wounds or thoughts trigger wounds. And in that process, the wounds or the words triggering the thoughts is also the pathway to healing. So even though it's minor, it could be, you know, just helping to uncover some of those places where you have trouble um, in your life and where healing needs to take place. Remember, Chiron and Aries is about you, self-acceptance, self-love, uh, any word literally that you could put the self in front of, um, it is the I am and what are you putting after those words, I am? I am what, right? And being able to look at that. So we want to watch for hurt feelings from hurt words or hurting hurtful words. And it's, you know, it's almost inevitable that either you will be the deliverer of some hurt feelings or hurt words, hurtful words, or you will be the recipient of it. The best way that we know that you can take care of this energy or you can be clean in this energy is to don't react to what comes up. Don't react to that irritation. Breathe first and then respond. And, you know, sometimes no response is better than response if those words are going to come out in a hurtful way. Be careful also of taking shortcuts, right? Your mind, moon and Gemini, moving fast, and Mercury in a um, in the irritation sort of with Chiron could have you skipping steps and then being irritable because you have to go back and do what you missed. Unless, of course, you're a manifesting generator, in which case skip away because that's when you do your best work. <laughs> that's how you're meant to be, skipping steps and you only go back if, you know, something in the outer world shows you that you needed to go back. If not, if you're not a manifesting generator, then, and a good percentage of you are not, then be careful of taking shortcuts, right? Don't, don't cut yourself short. Um, it'll be a great day today to ask questions of yourself 
of other people. If you want to ask Google, ask Google. She's really good. Or whoever is your Google voice, they're really good at getting answers. Probe deeper if you have questions, right? Don't just accept what you see on the news or what you see, you know, someone tells you or what you've read. Go deeper, right? If you're so inclined, today would be a great day to probe, right? To uncover, to look at what's underneath the hood and not just what the car looks like on the outside, right? Probing energy. All right, uh, looking quickly, let's see. Uh, Rebecca, can I ask why the gene keys through the G key, G, G, K, gene keys through Gemini have the earth trigram in the bottom with various trigrams on top? Um, that you're, you're asking a question about the I Ching because the trigrams are all, and the hexagrams all come from the Chinese divination system called the I Ching. And I'm not sure that it's related to the signs so much as it's related to the gene key or to the, uh, the human design gate. But because those gates and those gene keys actually do run through signs, like for example, if you, where's my, oh, it's in my book here. Let me see if I can show this to you. I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well. But on the back of this book, which I'm just about to get my new one, um, you see the mandala, right? This is the gene keys or the human design mandala. And this is not actually a really good one to show you, but you see out here, these are all the trigrams or the hexagrams. And even though they're low, you see in, in the middle part here, these are all the different line or the different gates. So here we have the trigram, here we have the gates, and then here we have uh, does that show the signs? Yeah, it does show the signs. It does show the signs. So if I look at that, gates 20 through uh, part of 15 are all in Gemini. And you're right, they're all the upper trigram. It just may work out that way. And um, I'm not as familiar with the I Ching as I am with the other things. But my guess is it's because it's extroverted energy and probably brings up left angle crosses more often than right angle crosses, meaning it's people oriented. And I, I, I can't tell you that for certain, but it would seem likely that that is the case, but you're right, those are all upper trigrams. <laughs> and what we're talking about is in the, the, um, the gene keys and the human design system are built upon four wisdom traditions, one of which is the I Ching. And when you, I think I've shown you guys this book before, The Book of Lines, written by Ketan Parkin. And if you open the book and you look at any, let's look at 20, because I know that's a Gemini gate. It shows you up here in the top, it shows you the trigram. It shows you the Chinese symbol. It tells you what the I Ching meaning is. And it shows you where it is on the human design chart. And it's highlighted down here where it is on the mandala. Then it shows you where it is on your human design chart. And it tells you what channels that gate would be a part of. And then over here, it tells you all of the degrees of the zodiac that would be included in that trigram or in that gate or in that gene key. And then over here on the facing page, it is the description of that placement in all of the various lines. There are six different lines it could be in. And the lines are based on the trigrams. So there's a lot to this. And that I don't talk about it very often because it can be very confusing. I get confused when I start, you know, intermingling that. Let's suffice it to say that it just further refines the meaning of that gate when it pops up in your human design or in your Gene Keys profile. I hope that would be enough for you there, Rebecca. But I encourage you, if you want to know more, look up the I Ching and have a better understanding of the I Ching, and that might help you as well. Uh, Colleen, oh, thank goodness I'm an um, MG manifesting generator as I do very little linearly. <laughs> That's true, right? Um, and you're divine. You're defined to do it that way. So that's awesome. And uh, I, you felt lost. Yeah. You know, if I let myself go diving into the, the I Ching, I get a little lost too, because it's symbolic. It's highly symbolic. And I suppose if I took the time to learn about the symbols, 
I, it might be better. Maybe I'll even dig into that for you guys a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. It would be just one more layer of knowledge that do I really need in this case? We shall see. Good morning, Kristen, and you're welcome, Rebecca. Uh, so anyway, the book, by the way, let me show you the book again, because I think this is one that most people can understand, is the Book of Lines, a 21st century view of the I Ching, the Chinese book of changes. Discover the person you were born to be. And what you would do is find your, your gene keys or your, um, your human design. Mostly what I would do is the sun and the earth, both on your personality side, the black column, and the uh, design side, the red column, and look those up. And this is a quick little um, talk about each of those gene keys for you. It's just another, to me, it's a quick reference. Um, but what you really need is to understand yourself in a more deep way. So maybe, you know, while the moon is in Gemini, do the superficial. <laughs> and then later when it moves, you know, in a few days when it moves into Sagittarius, then take the deep dive and look at the deeper point of uh, what that means. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, thanks. That was a great question, Rebecca. Uh, now, the Pleiadian Earth energy of the day is 11 devoting. For those of you who are new, the Pleiadian Earth energy is has two parts to it. One is the universal energy of the day. That's the, seen through the number, so the number 11. And then the second part is the word devoting, which is the Earth energy for the day. So we take the universal energy and the Earth energy, and we blend them together, and we get the energy for the day. So today's energy, the universal energy is 11. It's the number of the illumination, turning on the light, right? Bringing in the light shining it into the dark places. My husband got this really cool flashlight for his birthday and uh, he turned it on. And I mean, literally it was like, there would not be a dark corner that you, within its field, it's just so bright. And I was like amazed that they even make things that bright uh, because I would think it would blind people, but it's bright. Today is a light day. So bring in the light, the more light you shine, the more that you can see, and the number 11 is a number of illumination anyway, right? Even numerologically, the 11 brings on enlightenment or brings on illumination and uh, spiritual illumination, but it could also, you know, be those secret places that have been hidden from us that come to light, right? So we're bringing more energy to light or more things to light. The energy of devoting in the Mayan calendar was Auk, which is dog, and dog energy is very loyal energy, devoting energy, devoted, loyal, community-oriented, harmonious, and unfortunately, every energy has its opposite or its polar other end, and in this one, it is feeling stuck. If you're feeling stuck, there's, you know, a possibility that you just need to shine the light somewhere and bring it out. And it also can be a time where we discover inappropriate loyalties, where we have been loyal to something incorrectly and, uh, and it comes to light for you in some way. And that could be to a person, to a belief system, to a cause, uh, to the work that you're doing. It could be any number of ways in which you start to question the inappropriate way you've been loyal to something. And they call that the shadow to me. I think that's more like just being smart and just uh, the process of awakening to be able to do that. All right. So lastly today, I want to remember yesterday we talked about the gate 32, uh, the gate 32, the sun sitting there right here in your human design chart and in the spleen. And because through the month of October, the sun moves through every one of these gates, and it just so happens that this season, we actually have Mercury and Venus and Mars also moving through all of the gates of the spleen, that we were really looking at these gates because they double as paralysis points or fear points in a chart. So we have gone through quite a few of them already, 48, 57, uh, we've talked about 50, even though the sun hasn't been there yet, but Venus was there. So we were talking about 50 and we've, we've actually talked about almost all of them. I think uh, that one's 44. Sorry, Merc uh, Venus is at 44 now. 50 is opened again. Uh, next week, the sun goes to 50. And right now we're on 32, which is yesterday's fear was about failure. 
right? Failure and the, or I question, was it the fear of success perhaps for some people and for others, it may be the fear that we won't succeed. So I went to our handy dandy uh, Wisdom Keepers Inner Guidebook by Rosie Aronson, The 64 Faces of Awakening. And I would highly recommend that you get this deck of cards. The little book comes with the cards. And our card for the gate 32 or the gene key 32 is this one here, preservation. Remember it was the shadow of failure, the gift of preservation and the Siddhi of veneration. So you look at that very uh, indigenous looking, just lovely symbology. If you look at the face, that's why I love these cards. You can really just look at these cards and contemplate the vision of the card to be able to tap into its meaning, right? I think it just gives us that access and preservation card 32. And when you look in the guidebook, the guidebook has things arranged with a wisdom story and then a gift to you and then questions for contemplation. And here we go. As we listen to the great wisdom of our ancestors and of the indigenous tribal cultures, we will once again find our correct inner spirit. Um, the story, the wisdom story. My younger brother and I were both trained in the sacred medicine tradition. We lived side by side in the rainforest, each with our own simple camp. We always shared everything we had and served the same local community until a foreigner came to one of my brother's ceremonies and was so transformed by the experience that he spread the word far and wide about my brother's healing powers. Soon people started flying in from all over the world to work with my brother. At first I was happy for him. But over time, I watched his small camp turn into a retreat center and watched him travel to district countries to share our medicine and tradition with strange people who knew nothing about our ways. He brought back objects and healing practices I didn't recognize. Even the way he pruned, weeded, and brewed the medicine seemed new. His plants thrived in ways that made me feel uncomfortable. A constriction and anger took hold of my chest. I believed this was because he was betraying our ancestors and that it was my job to preserve the traditions. When my students showed curiosity about my brother, I acted like a true fundamentalist, forbidding them from visiting his center, warning them against his tainted ways. When my brother reached out to me with gifts, I refused them until he gave up. My community shrank like my heart. Slowly, my medicine began to lose its potency. My prayers stopped working. The animals stopped communicating with me. I felt disjointed. I was as cut off from the great creator as I was from my brother. Sensing my soul's suffering, he reached out to me one last time. I was shocked to see the pain in his eyes. It had never occurred to me that his soul was also suffering. He had been missing me, my love and guidance, and he feared I had rejected and disapproved of everything he did. It was then I realized that my own fear of failure had blinded me to my brother's humanity. I took his hand in mine, and ever since we've been each other's teacher, student, and best friend. Our community and medicine are thriving. My gift to you. This may not make sense, but it is true. When you refuse to receive, you are being selfish. Ooh, let's read that one again. When you refuse to receive, you are being selfish. If you truly long to experience success, then you must let go of the entire concept of success and failure. It is not your desire for money or outer recognition that you need to overcome. It is your fear of failure. I am here to encourage you to trust your instincts and reach beyond your comfort zone. The gift of preservation is all about preserving life itself, not just yourself. It requires that you learn from the ground yourself in the way. It requires that you learn from and ground yourself in the wisdom of your ancestors. It also asks you not to be afraid to learn and invest in something new or to receive from those who inspire you. It's time to look at your life and determine what and who are worthy of your energy and good for the whole. See what you want to keep alive and honor that with your whole heart. Love it. The questions for contemplation. Where are you flourishing in your life and what or who could use even more of your care, energy, and investment? Where do you feel like a failure? Are there ways in which you have been isolating yourself? 
Do you tend to mistrust those who are different from you? Use your instincts to know who your true allies are. Find a place in your life where you've been resisting change. Write down what you appreciate most about how things are, then find a way to breathe new life and spirit into the old routine. Pretty cool. Awesome stories. I love these. I love these cards and uh, I love this deck. So we've talked about the fears uh, where the sun is triggering that. And yeah, Debbie, you have these cards. I love them. These are just beautiful. And uh, Debbie Hedden says, I wasted no time buying Rosie's book and cards after she was on your show. Love them. They're just gorgeous. And I just love the way that um, she presents the material, right? It's, it's very approachable and it feels really good to be able to, you know, talk about failure in a way that is very human and uh, very, you know, you can resonate with that energy of failure here. But you also don't see like, oh, you know, you're so bad because you're a failure or you thought you were a failure, etc. Because there's always the gift in that, right? What you can discover about yourself and then contemplating uh, that path forward and uh, what, you know, bringing it up to mind. What is it that you've been, you know, afraid of or what is it that you've been holding yourself back from? Now, I just want to remind you also, and we're going to do this one as well, and I'm sorry that it's going to be a lot of reading. <laughs> out loud to you all. But if, uh, if you look, when you get your human or your uh, uh, gene keys hologenetic profile, you're going to see that you can turn on various um, parts of the chart. You can turn on the lines, you can turn on the hexagrams, you can turn on uh, the different infra pieces of information that could be on that chart. You can literally turn them all on. And in doing that, what you're going to see is that there are um, uh, the different points at which you can use this energy to uh, move through an evolution, let's say. So on the outer ring of this, which is your um, activation sequence or your incarnation cross, or to make it even simpler, it's the sun and earth combination in your um, profile, you're going to see that there are words on the outer ring that are going to tell you what it is that they represent. So the sun represents, by the way, your, um, it's not purpose, it is your life path, I believe, life's work. And on the outer ring, you're going to see that then the earth represents evolution. So the sun represents your life's work in your human design. This is the conscious line, by the way. And the earth represents your evolution. But the line between them is a challenge, right? There's a challenge. You're being challenged by the earth to evolve, right? And you evolve your life's work. So let me say that again. You're being challenged. I keep pushing buttons in my dang. There we go. You're being challenged to evolve your life's work. And when we have the sun earth combination every week, we talk about what the sun is doing and what the earth is doing. We have a challenge that's being given to us, the, an evolution challenge laid down by the earth and, you know, kind of like challenging the sun to apply this energy to, uh, to evolve, to grow. And the earth's challenge this week is about non-attachment right? Non-attachment. So it's at the gate 42 and the gate 42 sits here on the sacral, right? It's sitting right here on the sacral and it's reaching down to the root center, reaching down, but it's only halfway, right? So if you do not have a defined sacral, you likely still do not have a defined sacral because nothing here is defining it. It's just hanging off of it. So you'll experience this energy through other people. So let's take a look at then what is the earth challenging us uh, to do or to be. So the gift in this, uh, in the earth, so the, the gift is non-attachment or detachment. The Sidhi is celebration, uh, but the shadow is expectation. Now that one sticks for some people because aren't we taught to have an expectation? Isn't an expectation like a goal or an aspiration or a vision? Something that we are supposed to have in order to get what we want, right? So expectation is the shadow. Wow. So what does that mean for us? 
And here's what it says. Detach. Did I show you the card, by the way? Here's the card. Look at his face. Love, love, love that face. I love the candle on his nose, right? Can you see the light of illumination on his nose? Headed up to his third eye. Love that. Okay. Anyway, so detachment represents the process of letting go of control over your life, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Whew, the wisdom story says, known as the eternal optimist, I was always on my way towards something. The fulfilling relationship, the exciting job, the radiant health. I knew once I achieved that perfect life, I'd be able to rest and be happy. Uh, so I rushed past every milestone, always grasping and expecting, always willing to put off my enjoyment in the now for a better future moment. As I got older, I began to obsess about time. There was so much to do and it felt like time was running out until it did. During a basic medical checkup, something unexpected was found. I was diagnosed with a deadly illness. Suddenly, my life was spinning out of control. I was terrified, enraged. I have no time for this, I screamed inside, secretly feeling I'd failed at life. My optimism vanished, along with my faith in myself and others. For the next few years, I exhausted all of my savings as well as my loved ones, as I leapt from doctor to doctor, from conventional to alternative treatments. Terrified nothing would work, I abandoned each treatment before it had a chance to succeed. My practitioners saw me as flaky, but all I saw was disappointment and the slow death of my dreams. Finally, I became so ill that I was hospitalized. There was no spark left in me until I met my roommate, a child who was dying too. Her spirit was so full of joy and wisdom that my heart melted. She called me her buddy and shared about her own impending death with an acceptance and peace that put me to shame. The day she died, my heart literally stopped beating. The doctors tried to revive me while I floated up and out of my body and was drawn into a tunnel of indescribable light, color, and music. I felt a love beyond anything I'd ever known. Then I saw her, my friend from the hospital, skipping through a field of flowers and into my arms. Elated, I scooped her up as she whispered, It's time to go back, buddy. There's still so much to celebrate. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body, feeling calm and full of gratitude despite the pain. That was many years ago when I first became known as a medical miracle. Now when people look into my eyes, they feel my trust in life. I am not afraid for myself or for them. I've made peace with death. Now I am free to live, love, and appreciate each moment for the precious gift it is. My gift to you. I bring to you the gift of non-attachment. I'm here to remind you that everything in life must come to an end so that something new can be born. It is time to surrender to your life and accept your death. This does not mean you stop desiring, caring, or feeling. In fact, I want you to feel and breathe even more intensely than you ever have. Nor does this mean you can't hold expectations, just hold them lightly without attachment. Trust the intelligence of your life with its ebbs and flows, joys and pains. Even the most sorrowful states can be enjoyed if you can let your attachments fall away. Remember, you are an unfolding tale, its author and reader all at once. Never miss an opportunity to celebrate your magnificent self and life. And the questions for contemplation here are interesting to say the least. Where are you resisting change? For example, the aging of your body, the individuation of your children, an old way of thinking or being. What is coming to an end and, uh, or needing to die in your life? What or who do you need to let go of? Have you prematurely abandoned a project, relationship, or experience? What would it take for you to have true closure? Embrace a change in your life. Find a concrete and empowering way to celebrate it. Those are pretty awesome, if you ask me. Um, in, in the human design, this gate 42 is also known as the gate of completion. And it is a place where we can follow things through to their logical conclusion, right? Following your life through to its logical conclusion, which is death. But following any project or anything that you, is worth doing to its logical conclusion, completion, etc. 
So there you have it, our two gene keys for the week. And uh, I will, if you guys like, I will post those contemplation, contemplation questions for you uh, after the broadcast this morning. All right, I don't see any questions here. Anybody have anything that they want to talk about? Um, seems like you're all pretty quiet. I would have expected that with the moon and void, right? Everybody's inward, inward focused, right? So that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, in the meantime, that's it for me today. If you guys have anything, just go and put it on my Living Astrology page, and I would be happy to answer your questions. In the meantime, take care. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget, I won't be here in the morning. Uh, I will be back on Friday with the uh, daily forecast as well as a look ahead at the weekend. All right, guys. Much love to you all. Bye for now.